Medistand. Understanding Medicine. I am Professor Azizur Rahman, and we are discussing various congenital heart diseases. We have already covered uh, some common features. We have covered common clinical features of all left to right shunt, and then we have discussed atrial septal defect. And today we are going to take up ventricular septal defect. And I will also cover patent ductus arteriosus in this lecture. <clears throat> uh, I would like to mention that some common features, which are very important, common features of all left to right shunts are already discussed in a separate lecture. So if you have landed up here straight, you would probably not uh, appreciate the, these things very well. So I suggest you first watch that video, which describes common features of all left to right shunts. And once you're done, then come here and you will understand this part better. Now, first take, uh, let's take up this ventricular septal defect and the name is said for explanatory. Normally our interventricular septum is an intact structure there is no communication between two, two ventricles. But if there is a defect, then of course there will be abnormal flow of blood. And you, I think this point has been emphasized again and again. If there is abnormal communication between two sides, blood will always flow from the left to the right unless there is some additional outflow obstruction to the right. Since in ventricular septal defect, there is no additional uh, abnormality, so blood will flow from the left to the right. Okay, so this is why we call it left to right shunt. So when the time passes, this will lead to pulmonary hypertension and patient will end up having symptoms and this type of X-ray, clear cut cardiomegaly and this cardiomegaly, any experienced physician and, car and cardiologist and radiologists can tell that this is because of right ventricular hypertrophy, not the left ventricular hypertrophy because apex is not displaced left and down. So this is actually cardiomegaly because of the right ventricular hypertrophy and you can also appreciate the pulmonary conus which is prominent. This is due to dilatation of pulmonary artery, a feature of pulmonary hypertension. So in this case, I believe the diagnosis has been delayed and this patient is now beyond the scope of operation. Lung fields are also not clear. There is some opacities, perhaps due to increased pulmonary circulation, uh, which is part of this condition, ventricular septal defect. Uh, there are various types. I think ventricular septal defect can be classified on the basis of the size. It could be small, it could be medium, or it could be large. Of course, uh, that size would determine the hemodynamics. Bigger the defect, more blood will be shunted from the left to right and it is more likely that the child would be symptomatic. But it is perfectly possible that somebody may have just small shunt and that person may not have any symptoms whatsoever. That patient may be completely asymptomatic, physically absolutely normal, or may actually be a professional athlete. I have seen actually patients incidentally diagnosed with small VSD and they do not have any symptoms and because they have very, very small shunt. There is shunting of blood from the left to the right, but that much shunt is not enough to cause symptoms and is not enough to cause pulmonary hypertension. So that may be uh, left alone. These, these patients, they may have quite loud murmur. So if you have a murmur which is loud, uh, it is not uh, essential that this patient has a big hole. So I think we need to investigate this patient and the best test is echocardiography. Then it also depends where that defect is. You know, the interventricular septum is muscular, most of the part, the, nef in the, the lower part, I think more than two thirds, maybe three fourths of the septum is muscular. And the upper portion close uh, to the valves is membranous. Uh, 
as a child grows the muscle grows in size so any small defect in the muscular region sometime physicians or pediatricians they just want to wait and see sometimes when the muscle grows in size this defect just closes on its own but the one in the membranous part of course membrane does in the fibrous tissue does not grow the way muscle grows so that would persist so the operation is done or the whatever the treatment is done is done early so i think you need to know three things before you can plan proper treatment one you need to know what is the size of the defect and number two where exactly is it located and of course we would consider the symptoms and signs and pulmonary hypertension all will be considered before we plan treatment for this patient now this is the picture i showed in my earlier lecture also showing an abnormal communication in this case in the ventricular septum normally systemic circulation equals pulmonary circulation because the blood passes the same blood passes through both circulations but in cases of a ventricular septal defect one, some blood will be from the left ventricle instead of going to the aorta will go back to the right ventricle and recirculate through the lungs so the pulmonary circulation will be more than systemic circulation that would result in increased pulmonary pressure and pulmonary hypertension what are the physical findings in uh, ventricular septal defect let's discuss them there may be left ventricular hypertrophy or there may be biventricular hypertrophy but left ventricular hypertrophy is uh, more characteristic why patients with ventricular septal defect develops left ventricular hypertrophy because left ventricle is under volume overload by that i mean that left ventricle receives blood more than the usual during the diastole why that happens because number one the normal pulmonary circulation is coming to the left atrium and to the left ventricle that is the normal share of left ventricle but some blood which has gone during the previous systole during the previous systole when blood goes from the left ventricle to the right ventricle it has a shortcut comes back from the lungs and come back to the left ventricle again so left ventricle is actually under volume overload so that's why there is left ventricle hypertrophy now right ventricle may also get hypertrophy because there is increased pulmonary circulation right ventricle and uh, there is increased pulmonary pressure also right ventricle has to work against more uh, after load so right ventricle hypertrophy may also be there so you could have a combination of left ventricular hypertrophy or biventricular hypertrophy then very characteristic of ventricular septal defect is this murmur and this murmur is i think very hard to miss you need to be really deaf to miss this murmur this murmur is usually very loud and harsh and it may be associated with a thrill what is a thrill when you can feel a murmur of course we normally appreciate murmurs with the help of a stethoscope but if it is associated with thrill then when you put your hand on the chest you can appreciate that uh, that thrill i mean uh, that murmuring that that the vibration which is caused by that murmur any murmur which is loud which is harsh may have associated thrill so i think this murmur is not easy to miss at all you may have difficulty identifying this murmur but you would definitely you should at least appreciate that there is some murmur this murmur is localized to left sternal border this murmur is pan systolic now what is pan systolic that is the murmur which is heard throughout the systole and almost of the same intensity i will show you in the next slide in in a, in a picture but this is a pan systolic murmur that means it starts with the first sound stays throughout the systole of the same intensity and ends with the second in fact after the second sound so there is a pan systolic murmur which is loud and harsh uh, 
may be associated with cell and it is best heard on the left sternal border and there is no radiation. Why I am emphasizing this because there are two more conditions where there could be a pan systolic murmur. One is mitral regurgitation that we will discuss in rheumatic heart diseases. There are many other differences but one difference between uh, murmur of VSD and murmur of mitral regurgitation is that the latter murmur radiates to the axilla whereas the murmur of VSD does not radiate anywhere. It is very loud murmur it would be heard on a wide area but it does not specifically radiate to any direction. So that is the feature of uh, VSD murmur and another condition where there may be uh, pan systolic murmur that is tricuspid regurgitation. The murmur of tricuspid regurgitation is also heard on the same area but it and it also does not radiate but it has got some special features uh, like there may be a pulsatile level, there may be engorged neck veins whereas nothing such thing, uh, this thing does not develop in simple VSD. So I think these clinical features should enable you to differentiate murmur of VSD from the murmur of mitral regurgitation and murmur, murmur of tricuspid regurgitation. Now this is the picture, uh, you, this you know uh, the uh, diagram showing the first sound one component S1 and this is S2 two components. The first one is aortic, the second one is pulmonary and this is systole and it is followed by diastole. You can appreciate the systole is slightly shorter than diastole. Now this is the normal uh, state of the affair but what happens in VSD there is a murmur. You know this murmur starts with first sound and of the same in intensity and ends with second sound. In fact it is it may be impossible to appreciate first and second sounds separate than murmur. So pan systolic murmur. In the diastole there is no sound but in systole there is pan systolic murmur. And you would also notice that the pulmonary component as compared to normal uh, the pulmonary component is is taller indicating that the pulmonary component is louder. This is because of pulmonary hypertension which occurs in ventricle septal defect. The treatment if it is small and in the muscular part no treatment may be required. It, it is small it is not causing any problem and it is in the muscular part we hope that the muscle will grow and this will uh, occlude the defect. But if it is large or if it is in the membranous part then surgical repair is needed. Unfortunately at least to my knowledge there is no catheter treatment of VSG. These patients they actually need an open heart surgery. Uh, since many features are similar so I, I thought might as well uh, include patent ductus arteriosus also in this lecture. Now again you have the pulmonary hypertension type of thing but in this case this is the defect. This is the defe defect. Uh, this is uh, this one is aorta or aorta arch and this is pulmonary artery. So there is defect uh, and this is this this is normal for the fetus but at the time of birth this should close. And if it does not, it would call it would be called patent ductus arteriosus. So blood from the aorta, uh, the oxygenated blood from the aorta will go to the pulmonary circulation and will get recirculated through the lungs. And again, there will be increased pulmonary circulation and pulmonary pressure. So this is another picture of the same, uh, the, the communication between aorta and the pulmonary artery. The physical findings, number one, there is collapsing pulse. I think I would not go into details here because I'm going to discuss collapsing pulse in detail in aortic regurgitation because uh, the collapsing pulse is seen in its most characteristic form in aortic regurgitation. But very briefly, what is collapsing pulse is a pulse which is high volume and when you lift the arm like this, while you are still palpating the pulse then you would appreciate some increase in the volume of the uh, 
pulse which was already of high volume now this confuses many students they say that when you raise the arm the pulse collapses it's not like that pulse actually increases in volume when you raise the arm why that happen actually when you raise the arm because of the effect of gravity the blood from the aorta is regurgitating more to the pulmonary artery and that causes further drop in diastolic pressure now because of the drop in diastolic pressure there would be increased venous return to the left ventricle and further increase in stroke volume and the systolic pressure will go up and the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure that determines the volume of uh, pulse so that is why these people they have classical drop collapsing pulse there may be left ventricle hypertrophy just the way i explain in ventricular septal defect uh, the left ventricle is receiving more blood during diastole and there is continuous murmur like a machine is running it is a murmur which is heard both during systole as well as diastole so that means throughout the cardiac cycle but the intensity varies because the pressure gradient during systole is more than the pressure gradient during diastole there is always pressure gradient and blood always flows from the left to right but the the speed and the amount of flow would be more during systole so you would have a murmur which is more in intensity during systole and less during the diastole and that is that is what is meant by a machinery murmur a machine when runs has got different sounds changing in frequency i think this is what this is the reason we call it machinery murmur now this picture explains this this is the pan systolic murmur because there is abnormal flow of blood from the aorta to the pulmonary artery throughout systole and there is abnormal flow of blood from aorta to the pulmonary artery through a diastole as well but the the height of these lines they indicate that the gradient is more during systole and the intensity of the sound is more during systole so you will have a murmur uh, increasing in intensity and decreasing in intensity but continuous and best heard in the pulmonary area now what is the differential diagnosis of this when you have multiple conditions some of the murmurs may be diastolic others may be systolic now when you hear them with the stethoscope you might confuse different murmurs as one continuous murmur an expert can tell because in that case different murmurs will be heard better on different areas but the murmur of patent ductus arteriosus is best heard on the pulmonary area but it will change its intensity during systole and diastole the treatment if this condition is diagnosed at the time of birth then endomethacin because uh, normally the prostaglandins are involved in and the closure and endomethacin is anti prostaglandin so i think injection of endomethacin will help this closure to occur uh, but since diagnosis is usually missed at that time at least in our part of the world then the lay diagnosis made that can be uh, treated with the trans catheter closure this is uh, a catheter treatment uh, available in some centers so i think Uh, those who are diagnosed late they can be offered there would be some unfortunate people who might not be candidate for this and they would require open heart surgery still so this was an account of ventricular septal defect and atrial septal defect we have already covered uh, no sorry this was ventricular septal defect and patent ductus arteriosus we have already covered atrial septal defect so that completes our lesson on left to right shunt in my next lecture i'm going to take up right to left shunt because they are not that common although there are many right to left shunt but i'm going to cover all of them in one lecture so stay tuned and join me in my next lecture which is going to cover right to left shunt the main example is phallus tetralogy This is Professor Aziz Rahman from Medistan 
and looking forward to see you in my next lecture. Thank you.